Oh, there it is. Okay, hello. We are on, and I, my audio wasn't working right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Addressing Gettysburg. Today, this is a special Addressing Gettysburg. So special we have no intro music or not even Sam Elliott saying you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. You're listening oh, there he is. to Addressing Gettysburg. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we, yeah. It was, for some reason, I just hit play and it just decided to pause itself. I must have double tapped it by accident. But anyway, today uh, is Saturday, what, the 25th of June, I believe? And yeah, 25th of June. And we are doing a live show at 6 p.m., which is so odd. But uh, the reason it's odd is because of our guests. They're odd. No, just kidding. (laughs) It's because of uh, a busy schedule. And this is how we were able to fit them in. Uh, They've been on the show before. Actually, we did a takeover of uh, JD's uh, YouTube channel, and people told us to kill ourselves. And so uh, now we're going to do it on our channel, and hopefully you'll be nicer. Um, (laughs) No, So we've got uh, two people here that we all know and love. J.D. Hewitt from the History Underground and Eric Dorr from the Gettysburg Museum of History up on Baltimore Street. What's the number? 219. 219 Baltimore Street. And uh, we're just sitting here to talk about how wonderful they are is really what it is, right? We have no real agenda except to to talk about how wonderful they are. So let's get started. Uh, By the way, this is a call-in show. We want to hear from you. I know you want to probably ask these guys some questions. So the phone number is up on the screen, 717-420-1978. Call in at any time, and we will get to you when we get to you. Be patient, sit on the phone, and keep your mouth shut until we talk to you. All right, Eric and J.D., so you guys have been up to uh, a lot of trouble recently. Um, You've been uh, putting out videos called American Artifact, and um, tell us a little bit about this. Well, American Artifact is um, an artifact-based show. It's on his channel, which is uh, The History Underground, and he has the History Traveler series where he visits sites. And then we have another one on there called American Artifact, where we just feature artifacts and do a little bit of history also. I do the artifacts. He basically does the history. And it's been a a great experience. And, um, you know, we've got to travel to some pretty neat places. We went to Normandy recently, and we have a bunch of other stuff coming up. But yeah, it's it's been pretty amazing. You know, I have a lot of experience with TV. I've done a bunch of TV. Sure. Tell us about that. What what, did you, what have you done? You've been uh, on American Pickers. Yeah, Pawn Stars, American Pickers, um, The Weapon Hunter, uh, Travel Channel, bunch of other stuff. Baggage. What was battles. The Weapon Hunter? Well, I've never heard of that one. Um, it was on Smithsonian Channel. Okay. And we did one with uh, my friend, World War II veteran Jim Pee Wee Martin. Mm-hmm. And we fired some weapons. We compared German weapons with American weapons. And uh, Jim Pee Wee Martin outshot the host of the show, who's a weapons expert, which was hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, it was great. <laughs> yeah, he still had it. And, yeah. Uh, but, um, you, you know, sh- shooting the way we're shooting it, it it's much different you know when when i was doing all these those reality type television shows and even some of the other shows that we did um that you know we, we shot a whole series called american museum which never took off um for various reasons but um you, you know it, it it's just so much different doing it this way it's um you know we shoot one take usually i mean once in a while we'll have to reshoot something and it's it's really interesting to me the the contrast jd works l- like no one el- el- else i've ever worked with i mean he he's he's really good at what he does and it's just amazing how smooth it goes like when you when you do normal shows like you know the hollywood type shows you know, there's a lot of sitting around, a lot of waiting to go mm-hmm. on, and there's all these people standing around doing nothing. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's it's just it's just such a big contrast, and it seems like there's all these people getting paid to do nothing, and that's probably why tele- regular television costs so much money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when JD and I do it, it's like you know he's doing all the camera work, he's doing all the editing, and uh, I just you know I, there there is some waiting around while he's doing his part, but that's it. You know, it's it's we get an amazing amount of content in a short period of time. Yeah. When we went to Normandy in October. We shot, I, I, I don't even know how many episodes, but it was like we worked literally from sun up to sun down because he wanted to get as much light as possible. And, and his, JD's, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but, but like he, he was like um, 
we're here for a very short amount of time and I want to get as much as I can. And, you know, I had to eat once in a while. Like mm -hmm. I had to eat breakfast and Cheryl went with us, my girlfriend, and she's like, I need to eat, you know, and, and he was out shooting the sun, the sunrise down on Utah <laughs> beach and stuff. This guy works like no one else I've ever met in my life. And it's incredible. And he doesn't eat or sleep. I don't think so. I, re I remember you saying that after your trip, you're like, man, that guy is nonstop. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, well, I mean, it shows because he's got a lot of content. And, uh, you know, having, having been a videographer, you can't take your time. There's no such thing as, like, a leisurely day if you're shooting video. Because there's so much that you have to think of to shoot. you got to get as much coverage as you can, close-ups, you know, B-roll and all that stuff. And then you go around talking while you're on camera as well. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, you know, like Eric said, uh, the days are, are pretty full. Like I maintain a pretty aggressive tempo uh, mm. when I'm going out. I'll say. Uh, typically, you know, getting up four, four thirty in the morning, getting stuff prepped for the day. Time to go to bed. Um, ten, ten to eleven. Mm. Typically. Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I don't, I don't get a whole lot of, yeah. a whole lot of sleep. No, not, like not if you're that. waking up at four thirty in the morning. Yeah, and the like the not eating part. It's, it's mainly I just forget to eat. I wish I could forget to eat. <laughs> God. Yeah, because because yeah, I'm just trying. It's it, it's a, a very short amount of time to get a whole lot done. Yeah. Um, I was telling somebody um, yesterday that because um, they were talking about you know all the places that, that I've been and stuff like that, and uh, how I get to travel all the time. And I was like, well, that's kind of a a big misconception about the the channel. Um, it it kind of gives the appearance that you know I, I just travel. <laughs> that's my lifestyle right I'm just, you're like, just constantly time. traveling yeah but what it is is um you know I'll, I'll go for like maybe a week at a time or maybe a three-day weekend or something like that and then i'm i'm just absolutely filming as much content as possible yeah and, and then that that content that i get in a week's time might last me for three months and you go all over the place you just got back from the south pacific right yeah 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 so tell us a little wild. bit about that uh so for the the longest time um, I've, I've had a lot of people saying, when, when are you going to go to the South Pacific? When are you going to cover the Pacific theater? Mm. Uh, the, 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 the poor Marines have had no representation on my channel. Um, so anyway, well, you're um, very anti-Marine. I heard, uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> just trying to start trouble. I, yeah. I think, I think you're referring to, uh, to Eric, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I uh, finally had a chance to uh, take a couple of weeks, go out there. Uh, logistically, it's the most complicated trip I've ever put together. Uh, like, just getting to the South Pacific is, is way more complicated. It involves more flights and is longer. Yeah. Than your... how, long, how long are you on a plane for? Um, so my trans-Pacific flight, so from the U.S. to, well, technically Guam and Saipan, they're all the U.S., but from mainland U.S., to Guam uh, was about 14 or 15 hours. It's stopping yeah. anywhere? Uh, stopped in Hawaii. Hawaii. Briefly. Yeah, okay. stopped in Hawaii, got a candy bar, got on another flight, and was immediately off to Could you just stay in Hawaii and pretend that you were in <laughs> all those other places? I, I came back to Hawaii. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. 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 But anyway, went to uh, Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, uh, which were all part of a, an operation called Operation Forager mm -hmm. uh, in World War II. Um, had the uh, second and fourth Marine Division uh, land at Saipan and Tinian, along with the 27th Infantry Division. So anyway, went went there uh, and then came back and, and went to Hawaii and spent a little bit of time there uh, gathering some content. Um, but yeah, my, my wife joined me for the Hawaii part. She said, uh, <laughs> she said you are not going to Hawaii <laughs> without me. Without me. I, I don't know if it turned out to be the Hawaii trip that she had always uh, dreamt of. Well, uh, but she got to see it. She got to Where'd see it. Where'd you go in Hawaii? Uh, so of course you go to Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Um, and then there there are some other places that we went. Uh, went to the Big Island, uh, where they have Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Um, filmed some stuff there. Uh -huh. uh, that that kind of traces back to the you know the first Hawaiians that uh, occupied that island. Uh, you know sailed over you know with the the Polynesian Islands. Uh, really fascinating uh, to to learn about that history. Kind of something out of my wheelhouse. So now when when all is said and done, uh, how how far into the content that you release is all the stuff that you shoot, let's say over the summer? Like, does that, do you shoot enough stuff to release a full year's work? Cause you're a teacher during the year, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. you've got to go to a, a job. Y yeah. 
Yeah. So well, do, they like for me to. <laughs> <laughs> do you take a lot of time off? Some. You, yeah. And you some. call it a sabbatical? Uh, no, just no. You just, just a few days take off. A, yeah, yeah, a few days off, and yeah. then you. But you'll travel more stateside usually during yeah. that time. Yeah. And um, so so okay. So but most of the stuff that you shoot is over the summer, right? Yeah. And then you release it as it's finished during the year. Do you have a schedule when you release things? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, like, as far as like a weekly schedule, the History Traveler stuff typically is Sunday and Wednesday, and then the American Artifact videos are on Friday. I had to scale back a little bit just because I was running out of time and content. So I'm mm. just doing two episodes mm. a week right now. Yeah. But um, yeah, this this stuff that I just shot in the South Pacific will probably last about three months. It's hard. Months it's hard content. to keep up with a schedule, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and especially because you're a one man show. I'm a one man band. You do your shooting, you do your editing. Yep, and that's a lot. The yeah. editing is tedious stuff. It 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 can be. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it is. Don't say it can be. It, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it is because you'll put you'll you'll spend uh, hours sometimes uh, working on something that's only going to get three seconds of screen time. Yes. Yeah. And people, you know, people don't get that. Yeah. It's a lot of stuff. It's a yeah. lot of work. There's there's a lot of work that goes into it, and a lot of time. Uh, I I enjoy. The, the creative process. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you, you put all that time and effort and heart into it just to have, uh, you know, some some Yahoo from Minnesota criticize you. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Something the thing stupid. that you've been doing that I love. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question for J.D. or Eric or anybody, call in 717-420-1978. Uh, the thing that I love that you started doing is you were putting screenshots up of, <laughs> of these stupid-ass comments that people leave you. And uh, and your your smarmy response, which I love. Yeah, it cracks me up because there's nothing more annoying. Because I get those too. I just delete them. I don't. Do, I used to delete them, mm -hmm. and then because I'm like, you know what? It's f you. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like, do the just try to do this once. Yeah, and then you know. And uh, I'm like, whatever, uh, delete it. But now, after you, you've inspired me to get, you know, <laughs> smarmy back with them and everything, and it never really turns into any. Do you ever like get into a fight with these people? Do they come back with you? No. Oh, oh, yeah. I'll have people that will will kind of um, argue you know, with and you. try and argue with me and stuff like that. And um, I, I try and be uh, aggressively kind. Yes. With with everything that that I do. So. Um, you know, people say, you know, I, I wish that you would show more of the artifact and less of your face. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm yeah. like, yeah, absolutely, man. It, it, you know, think of my poor wife who has to look <laughs> at this thing every day. Right. Um, but kind, kind sarcasm is what I like to use. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I say aggressively kind. It's probably more passive aggressively yeah, kind. Oh yeah. um, but I had uh, I had somebody the other day that it, it's a complete waste of time on my part, and I, I shouldn't have engaged them. But I was like, I'm going to just kind of toy with this person and, and they kept answering and kept you know with comebacks and you know criticisms and everything what was like it that. about do you remember i can't remember what it was about yeah. i get so many of them was it political or was it just about you no, showing was, too much of your face and not the artifact it or was something? it was something about the content I, I can't remember what it was they they didn't like that i didn't show something or that i should have talked about it more and things like that so anyway they kept going so kept why don't going, they make going. the video so finally well, yeah exactly yeah. um which is one of my common responses. Like, hey, man, you should start a channel. Yeah. I would watch it. I would yeah. like to learn from you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, finally, I, I, I said, hey, listen, I, I really do appreciate all of the comments that you've been leaving. Because every time you leave a comment, that feeds into YouTube's algorithm right. and ensures that more people are watching this video. Uh, which in turn gets me more ad revenue. I said, you, you're you helping have, me. You have been doing yeah. me a great favor. <laughs> yes. That was the last comment. He didn't reply to that one. <laughs> he, was, he was done after that. That is a great point. So leave a lot of negative comments on this video, please. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we yeah, I got, I got another one. Um, you know, sometimes they make comments about me too on his, on his page. Um, or, you know, what do they page. say about you? All kinds of stuff, but like, um, cut your hair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 They, some people like don't the like 70s my ponytail. Called, they want their hairdo back. Yeah. That type of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And and uh, y you know, this this one guy um, who claimed to be some kind of great intellectual mm. person mm, one of those. Um, didn't didn't like the way I was pronouncing a German word or something, and I should have studied that a little bit better. 
and um, and it turned into some you know because we we do a lot of World War II content and sometimes there's some Nazi items or World War II German items that are a little controversial to say the least and uh, that that sometimes brings out some interesting people too um, mm -hmm. but this guy was just going on and on about my pre pronunciation and all this stuff and and he wrote some comments on on the page and and I don't comment on the page because JD does not want me commenting. Right, you, know, he, what? He no, you don't want to get into he, that. He, he handles it a yeah, lot better yeah. than I would be able to, <laughs> for sure. You would just be like, well, F you, dude. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But um, <laughs> but anyway, he, he, he wrote this this comment, and and then he wrote this thing, and it, and it looked like, you know, there, there was like, I, I don't even know how to describe it, like, like capitals and small letters and all these misspellings. And he was this big intellectual guy correcting me. And... um. And he wrote something like, "Oh, I have a floating, <laughs> uh, a floating uh, uh, mouse, uh, a floating uh, caps lock." That's it. Yeah, that's it. And, and JD just responded and said, "Oh, it's that dang floating cap lock thing again. That's what, what the problem is." But anyway, the funniest part about it was yeah. he not only made that comment, and I guess because his cap lock was messed up, he had to call the museum. Oh, and and, and it was at a time. When uh, I, I was down at the uh, down at the National World War Two Museum for an event for a veteran that I that I'm friends with, and uh, and he kept calling because my my answering machine at the museum only records, I don't know maybe three minutes, so he was going on and on and on and then it would stop, you know it would cut him off so so he called back <laughs> and he kept doing it and and I could tell. <laughs> Did you save this? No, because oh. it, it took up too much room on my yeah. answering machine. I had Buy to, another tape. I know, I know. Well, it's not on tape. Oh, but anyway, tape? I, okay. I should have recorded it on my iPhone because it would be yeah. fun to play yeah. tonight. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Think but, about that but, next time. Yeah, I know. I, I, I should have. But, but, you know, I was listening to it, and, and, you know, my girlfriend Cheryl comes down, and she's like, what is that? And I said, I don't know. And, and like, it seems like he, he, he would get cut off, and he had to think about it for a minute. And then he came back later, <laughs> and I could tell each one – he was more intoxicated and more angry <laughs> and more intellectual. Uh, it, it, it was, what it was, was he angry about? My mis uh, mispronouncing German words yeah. and and like I had you know some German word that I didn't get right or something like that. And you know he, you're pissing off Germans and all this stuff. I mean it was like no, well yeah, don't, do that. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah. piss off the Germans. <laughs> yeah. Well here's uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, Germans. Here's somebody who knows how to speak German uh, on the line now. And uh, is this six questions? Yeah, this is six questions. Hey, six questions. Uh, what's going on? Hey, I just have a few questions. That's not a surprise okay, at all. Just a few. I... So your few questions now. <laughs> just a few questions right yeah. now, yes. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> my first uh, question is to JD over there. Yeah. Uh, we're coming up on the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg, and your videos on Gettysburg were just absolutely phenomenal. Thank you. Would you consider doing any other videos about the campaign as a whole, either before or after the battle? A hundred percent. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm planning on coming back probably sometime next year. I, I didn't want to compress too much Gettysburg content on the channel. Um, you know, I already did had a huge series last summer, um, but but I want to do something on, like you said, the the campaign leading up to the battle and then the first day, because I, I think that's something that really gets underrepresented mm -hmm. at, at Gettysburg. Uh, and then maybe hit, hit a few other, you know, maybe lesser known things uh, here on the, the battlefield. Um, but, but yeah, I, I definitely plan on, on doing that. Uh, and then, yeah, I think something on the retreat would be, would be good as well. Yeah. Sure. Hey Mike, thanks for giving him ideas that we should be doing with Joe. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Good job, Mikey. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> okay. I'm doing, I'm doing what I can to help content, right? Okay. Or lack thereof. Yeah. Oh, um, man. What but, else you got, Mike? But uh, this, this next is for Eric Dorr. Yes. Um, this is the anniversary of the Battle of Little Bighorn. And do you have anything in your museum connected question. to that event in history? Uh, no, we don't. Um, we did have a few items that we ended up trading to someone else. And I did have some Native American artifacts at one time, but um, it went to another museum because um, we don't really interpret that too much, you know. So, um, 
Yeah, I, I, I really don't have anything connected to Little Bighorn. Mm. That would be cool okay. if you did. Yeah. Well. All right, Mikey. Well, <laughs> anything else? Any other ideas you want to give them? Yes, I is. <laughs> actually, this one's actually going to be a little more serious of a question. Okay. Uh, for JD. Okay. Yes. Um, some of the content that I've seen this last year that was heartbreaking, but also really uh, intellectually just helped me understand what was going on on a different part of the world was what you did with the Ukraine. Oh. And um, do you have any sort of updates? And are there any reputable charities that we can donate to that can help out the people of Ukraine? Um, so as, as far as updates, um, since I left, um, I mean, if you keep up with the news or anything, the, the Russians withdrew from the area uh, around Kiev. And uh, most of the fighting is, you know, in the, the southeast part of the, the country uh, right now. And the, that stuff, I was really conflicted about filming that and showing it because, I mean, my, my son and I were there to work. Um, so, so really what you're seeing in, in those little dispatches uh, is, is not really reflective of what we were seeing, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, basically, whenever there was downtime, that's whenever I'd grab the camera and, and do a little bit of uh, filming. Um, but... But but since um, since we were there, uh, yeah, most of the the fighting has um, yeah been focused in the southeast. Uh, city of Mariupol has just been destroyed. Mm. Um, yeah, talked to a lot okay. of people who came out of that area. Of course, we have we have friends there. Um, I, I have a, a history in Ukraine that that predates this past trip. Uh, right. Yeah. You you adopted your kids from there, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. I remember so, writing that. Yeah. The uh, the area. Um, like in Donetsk, that's where I spent most of my time. Um, so Are you Ukrainian? Do what? Are you Ukrainian? I'm. I consider myself an adopted Ukrainian. Okay. <laughs> I mean, well, how did yeah. you how did you come to adopt kids from Ukraine? So uh, my my wife and I are, are both uh, people of faith and, and believers, and uh, you know, there's a verse in the book of Galatians that, that talks about uh, you know God adopting us into His family. We're, we're spiritual outsiders, and He adopts us. In. So we were inspired by that. So uh, we decided to uh, to adopt, and uh, whenever we were looking at different places, different options in the world, um, we found out that in Ukraine, uh, upwards of 80% of the girls um, in the orphanages who age out at 16 and aren't adopted, uh -huh. uh, upwards of 80% end up getting trafficked into the sex trade. Is that true? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, most of the boys end up in prison. Um so wait, 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 why? Because they have no choice but a life of crime, or they just yeah. throw them in a prison. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's, they end up pursuing like, oh, crime yeah. or things that's, like that. That's awful. So, uh, so we um, were kind of moved by that and thought, hey, if we can go over there, the um, the original intent was to go over and dot and adopt a child, and uh, we ended up with three. Uh, so it's kind of like going to Sam's. We got them in bulk. Um, but in <laughs> in the, so in the same trip, you got all three? No. Oh, oh, oh okay. No, um, I have two girls and a boy. Um, so we, we got my girls first. Uh, while we were there, found out that they had a half-brother who wasn't available for adoption. Mm. Uh, so over the next two years, uh, I took a couple trips back. And... Uh, very very long story compressed down um you know god opened some doors for us and we were able to adopt him too are the girl sisters yes so they're sis they're full sisters mm -hmm. and then they have a half brother yeah and then you were able to get him eventually yeah oh that's great so then they're all together yes wonderful how old were they when you got them uh, my girls were seven and five and uh my boy who is the oldest uh was 10 okay we got him good um yeah well you're you're a remarkable guy jd I mean, really, I don't know where you find the time and energy to do a third of the things that you do. <laughs> but really, I mean, that's a lot. And yeah. we were talking before at the museum, you know, about traveling overseas yeah. and everything like that. And I just listening to you talk about the places you've been to gives me anxiety. Just thinking about the, all the schlep you have to go through to get there. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and you and you do it and you do. I, I mean, my hat's off to you. I couldn't do that. Yeah. I don't even like driving four hours back to New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've I've had some interesting Nobody experiences. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Nobody likes going to New Jersey. <laughs> but go ahead. 
Yeah. No, that that was all. I No, what'd you say? I'm sorry. I, oh, I'm sorry. I said uh, yeah, I've had I've had some interesting experiences. I yeah, you have. Weird I weird things happen to me. But. Um well, it's so talk about Mike, you got another question? Yeah, one more for Eric Dorr. Okay, so this and is be four from... questions left. Go ahead. <laughs> four questions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um so the book about Ronald Spears. Yes. Um what was the most surprising thing you discovered in the whole process there? What's the thing that really made you go, "Wow?" Well, we the the book Fierce Valor, um, which is a biography of Ronald Spears, a true story of Ronald Spears and his band of brothers. Um, w that was quite a research project, you know, and it it started with just basically our what I had in the in our files from the Dick Winters collection, some correspondence between him and Major Dick Winters and historian Stephen Ambrose. But I was also in contact with his family and. Uh, Jared worked with one side. My co-author Jared worked with one side of the family, and I worked with the other side of the family. And uh, I, I had met him before because they they had um, donated some items to the museum, and then some more items came later. But the thing that really was the most surprising and um, kind of heartwarming about the whole thing was, um, you know, we had this this perception that Ronald Spears was quite a warrior, which he was, but he was also maybe a little cold-hearted. Dick Winters called him a killer, um, mm -hmm. which he was. Um, but, you know, you needed killers on the American, in the American Army during World War II. But the most surprising thing was how loved he was by his family and how much, how, how many members of his family really couldn't even tap into the killer instinct that he had in the way things were being portrayed in in the both the book and the series band of brothers in fact the the side of the family that jared worked with in boston they didn't even believe some of the stories and we kind of had to break it to them that hey you know they were true but they were we they weren't perceived or they weren't um, shown exactly the way they happened, and it was more of a, you know, he had to do what he had to do kind of situation. And we tried to illustrate that in the book, but just, you know, he he was he was a loving father, a loving grandfather, great grandfather, and and just loved by his family. And they, and it's almost like they couldn't believe that mm. at one time he was, you know, a trained killer. You know, after we did that interview with you guys, I went and watched Band of Brothers again and paid a close attention to the way he was portrayed. And I, it, this is, this, maybe this is just the actor portraying it, or maybe it's because I knew from the interview that, um, he, his family had a hard time believing all these things. It seems to me like he's the actor portrays him in a way uh, almost like I'll never be able to do this in my life without getting thrown in jail. So I'm going to I'm going to like get this out of my system, just this like warrior side of me out of my system. I'm going to be the best at it that I can be, but I'm completely in control and I know exactly what I'm doing and it's measured and I'm going to stop once I get out of this. You know what I mean? Like, there's kind of a twinkle in his eye when he does it, and then there's, there's, there's scenes with him where he's very um, normal. Like he, he's not, you know, like when he's talking to a, a fellow officer or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, but the thing is, like, unlike a lot of the guys in Easy Company, um, he stayed in. You know, yeah. and and he yeah. he he tasted combat again during the Korean War, and you know he stayed in the army for his entire career. Yeah. So, um, you know, he 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 knew he was good at what he did. He knew he was a good combat leader. Why do you think he denied the British wife? Didn't he deny that he had a British wife at some point? No. Um, the, the, there was a misconception about in the book that, that his British wife, um, who was you know war bride, there, there was a pregnancy involved and, and a son involved, but she, um, she was engaged to a British soldier who was captured during World War II. Mm -hmm. And they thought, because there was no communication, that he was killed in action. That's what they were told. So at the end of the war, he came back. And, you know, that was her love. And, you know, although she had fathered a, a son with Ronald Spears, um, her, her, I guess, 
true love came back and the decision was made because Ronald Spears decided to stay in the army mm, okay. that he was going to go back. But um, in the book, they, they said that she was married before, but they weren't. They were actually just engaged or they were an item. Right. And he got really upset about that. He didn't care or he didn't seem to be bothered about the accusation, uh, ac you know, the, the accusals of being shooting German prisoners or any of that other stuff or shooting one of his own men, which actually did happen. He was upset about the way his former wife was portrayed as. Well, sure. Yeah. And, and <laughs> yeah. And he, he was livid about it. And, you know, and, and it was really interesting because when they did the interviews um, for the series, you know, Dick Winters, one, I, I, we have the correspondence. He was practically be pleading with him to do these interviews. You need to do these interviews. And he, he wanted nothing to do with it because he was so upset by the book, Band of Brothers, and how his wife was portrayed. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. interesting yeah. Sure. Interesting stuff. All right, Mike, is that it now? That's, that's it for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mikey. Talk to you later. I, I listen to every episode of, of this podcast. Oh, yeah? His, I, I, throw, I know you guys make you know jokes about six questions, Lintz, and everything. Right. I, I legitimately enjoy his questions. Like He's very smart. That You have to have a depth of knowledge in order to be able to ask those kinds of questions. Like He asks questions, and I'm like, I, I don't even know enough to ask that question. Yeah, well, exactly. Kind of the thing, though, is he only asks the questions he already knows the answers to. <laughs> but, but they're good questions. <laughs> for, for the rest of us, they're really good. Well, it reminds me of, like, the, the questions a teacher would formulate for a test, you know? Like, the teacher knows the answer. The teacher knows that you should know the answer, and so she's going to put it in the question because <laughs> um, he does that a lot. But, yeah, no, he's very good. We actually are starting. We started shooting. We got a videographer finally. Uh-huh. Because people will always say, how come you don't do, you're in Gettysburg, why aren't you doing more YouTube videos and everything like that? And I'm like, I don't know, get the government to add more hours to the goddamn day, <laughs> and then I'll do it. And give me energy. <laughs> I can only, you know, whatever. Uh, and so finally we found a guy, and he's, he's come on board with us, and um, we're, the first series that we're doing is called Six Questions with Mike Lentz. That's good. And each episode goes to a different part of the battlefield, and we have six questions that Mike is going to answer about those parts of the battlefield and we shot our first one last week that's good uh yeah and and uh we'll we'll see i gotta put it together still but um uh yeah but but that's what we're gonna start doing now because 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 his questions are really good yeah and uh people know him as six questions lens and you know i i feel i feel like i kind of owe it to him because i tease him about falling and like you know like this is his theme song <laughs> right and so <laughs> so like i feel like oh, okay i'm always teasing this guy but he really knows his stuff yeah. you know he's really smart and i like he got uh certified to be a guy down at um uh, uh, uh brandy station yeah and um i i from the time he said i think i'm going to take the test to the time he took the test i think it was only like two months wow so I mean, and he was able to, you know, study it and everything. And we went today at lunch. We uh, we went, you know, we took a tour with Jim Hessler this morning mm -hmm. of East Cavalry Field, which I highly recommend anybody do, if you ever can get a hold of Jim Hessler. He's a very busy man, but if you can ever get him available, take a tour of East Cavalry Field with him. It will it will just make it. It just makes yeah. more sense now, you know. Anyway, so after that, Mike and I went to lunch. And uh, we were talking about Brandy Station. I was just asking him all these questions. I didn't know the answers to the questions. <laughs> I was just asking him questions. And he's, oh, well, this and that and the other thing. And he's very good at analyzing uh, information and, and interpreting it and kind of putting his own spin on it, but not like some wild cockamamie theory, just very like down-to-earth, measured, good uh, theories and, and yeah. ideas and stuff like that. He's very good. He's Dude, very good. I saw a couple of tour videos that, he did. I don't even know what the context was or why he yeah, was doing it. That's with Joe. That's the with, guy that I commandeered as our, our I co opted okay. him. I was like, okay. hey, 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 Mike's my guy. Was it on <laughs> was it Peach Peach Orchard Publishing? Peach Orchard Publishing, yeah. yeah. Those were really good. Yeah. And I, know. And I was kind of mad after I watched them because I was like, man, why didn't you do this like two or three years ago? That way I could have. Like well, left us basically, alone and, and no stolen the content <laughs> and made myself sound smarter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just stole the guy. Okay. You know, I said I I contacted that guy uh, Joe Peach Orchard Publishing oh. is Joe, and I said, hey, listen, man, uh, why uh, 
why are you why are you approaching my boy? Why don't we work together? You know, you go do whatever you want anywhere else, but Gettysburg is my turf. This is my turf. I'm gonna have this conversation with you too. It's my turf. <laughs> I should have the Godfather theme now. But anyway, um, I'm glad you guys are doing that. I'll, I'll watch that. Yeah, that'll no, be cool. it, it, we're gonna put them out in the winter. So okay. we're gonna shoot them all summer and then put them out over the winter. Okay. Yeah, there's there's no rush. Guarantee you, one thousand percent, people are going to leave a comment that says. Why is Gettysburg so green this time of year? I thought, <laughs> yeah. why are there leaves on the trees? Is Gettysburg in the deep south? Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> Lee was invading the north to the deep south. Um, all right, so what else? Let's see. There's, uh, oh, let's, so tell me, uh, you recently went to, to Guam and Saipan and all that, mm-hmm. but you, there were a couple of moments where uh, you, you almost uh, bought the farm, <laughs> if you will, or could have. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a way of um, fi- finding my pl- myself in places that um, I, have, I probably shouldn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, do you ever hear the uh, old phrase, curiosity killed the cat? <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. So, uh, gosh, there's one of several stories that I could talk about with riots and uh, sacrifices in Guatemala and all kinds of stuff like that that I've Sacri- like human sacrifices? No, no, they were sacrificing like animals. chickens and yeah, yeah, went, goats. I was, yeah. Um, long story short, went, went to uh, um, this ancient Mayan ruin in Guatemala, walked up, and uh, there were some, some people that were performing a sacrifice there on an altar and That's fun. everything like that. Now, was this in an official capacity, or was this a bunch of people that just like went there and did that? I didn't ask. Oh, you didn't ask. <laughs> you were afraid you were next. Uh, yeah, the guy, yeah. the guy who was taking us in there, turned around and looked at me, and he said, "Be careful with that camera." And oh. Like, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, but anyway, then we went in a cave, and there was a candle lit back there, and there was a bunch of sacrifices that had taken place back there, and um, it was it was weird. And as we were coming out, there was a dude standing there with a shotgun, so we <laughs> hid out and waited in the cave for a while, and then. Uh, <laughs> God. Anyway, that's another story. Wow, <laughs> wow. Yeah, but anyway, do yeah, you in- do you dress up like Indiana Jones when you, you should have that kind of a, a look to you when you do this? No, no, I, I just look like some dumb redneck stumbling around <laughs> in situations that he shouldn't be. I in. think you know, Dirty Billy sells Indiana Jones hats. You should go pick one up before you leave and get yourself a leather jacket and a bull whip. Because honestly, I think you need it. Uh, you need some kind of protection when you go in these places. Yeah. You, what an adventure. Okay, so tell us about the Guam. What happened in Guam? Uh, so, so Guam, I got there, um, you know, rented my vehicle um, and was, was making my way to, to the south part of the island and um, stopped a, at this spot where um, Ferdinand Magellan, um, you know, stepped off on the island, stuff like that, and... Um, had the, this dude from the Navy, young guy, uh, accidentally back up into my rental car. Um, so got that all sorted out. And, <laughs> uh, and then I went down the road and uh, passed the, the spot that I thought I needed to turn. So, so I, I pulled into this driveway. And as I'm going out, I look. And uh, apparently the, the gentleman who lived there was, was not too happy with the fact that I pulled into his driveway and threw a wrench at me. And uh, barely missed missed the car, mm. and uh, I foolishly stopped because I was like, "Well, that's kind of weird. Somebody throwing a wrench at me. I wonder why he did that." <laughs> <laughs> so I rolled down my window, and he came up, and he's and he's uh, visibly angry, and and he said, "What are you doing on my place?" Oh. And I was like, "Oh, I just missed my turn, and I was turning around." And he goes, "Oh, you want some mangoes?" Uh, and I was like. No, wow. No. <laughs> he goes from wanting to kill you with a wrench to your best friend. Then he got hospitable. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So Let me nurture you. Okay. So, um, Nourish. So then, so then I left there and uh, went to this spot where, where this massacre took place. Or I, was, I was looking for it. Now, what's the story of the massacre? Uh, so as the Americans uh, were moving towards Guam, uh, the, the Japanese who were occupying the island uh, – gathered up this group of Chamoran people. Chamorans are the, the native people of Guam. And uh, essentially they they picked out the, the largest and the strongest men who might potentially resist, and uh, they, they took them to this cave and massacred this group of people. So I was wanting to tell this story and, and go to this place. Um, turned down this road, and this place is like off in the jungle, so it's not like a roadside stop. Right. 
And as I'm driving down, I'm seeing um, a, a questionable looking neighborhood that, that I'm in. And there's all kinds of signs saying, beware of dog, no trespassing, um, you know, all kinds of different things like that. And there are these groups, small groups of men, and they're just kind of glaring at me as I'm going by. And uh, I was like, well, this, this kind of has a weird feeling. Couldn't find the place, and I didn't want to trespass. So I went back to a gas station was asking if they knew how to get to this place. And there was this 16-year-old boy there. He's like, oh, I'll show you. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So he, he said, uh, I said, do you need to, like, tell anybody where you're going? He's like, no. I was like, <laughs> no, because I'm going to kill you. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, okay. So, so he hops in the car with me. We go and we stop at one of these groups of guys. Um, and he, you know, says, Hey, can we go to the spot? Yada, 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 and go through your property. And I'm like, uh. man, this could be a setup. This doesn't feel right. Um, and it was getting late in the day. So anyway, he, we go, he, we get to the spot where there's a Creek and water was too high. I couldn't cross. And he said, yeah, you just go over there. Just wait it. You'll be fine. And, uh, and then he says, don't be here after dark. Ooh. He said, it's not safe around here for a white boy like you. Ooh. I was like, Hmm. That's scary. <laughs> I didn't have the soundtrack to go with it. <laughs> um, but but he said, yeah, he, he emphasized that I, I didn't want to be there. Yeah. And um, so the creek was up anyway, so I ended up not being able to go to that site. So the creek, yeah, okay. Because imagine what, how far, if you crossed the creek, how far would it have been? Uh, about a mile. A mile? Yeah, it was about a mile. In, in the jungle? Yes. No nicely manicured uh, trails or... Anything like that. It's just basically wild jungle. I think there was a path. There was a path. I think. Okay. Well, you don't know. Yeah. I had it marked on a GPS. <laughs> <laughs> God. Now, so did that scare you? Uh, I, was, I was aware of, you know, uh, of my surroundings and was, yeah. was trying to practice some, um, some caution and yeah. things like that. I do that all the time. I don't leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't leave the country either. Guam is a territory of the U.S. <laughs> yeah, it's leaving the country. <laughs> it's a territory. It's not the country. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, so, uh, oh, I think we have another caller here. Uh, looks like it's someone named Lisa Audie Murphy. Lisa Audie Murphy. Does that sound familiar to you? I don't know. Lisa Audie Murphy, are you there? Uh, I'm here, but um, I the recording was asking me what I wanted to ask you about. <laughs> oh, you want to ask about Audie Murphy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Your name is Lisa, and you want to ask about Audie Murphy. It's a voice-to-text screener, yeah. and it doesn't always yeah. get it accurate. Go ahead. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, yeah, uh, first, I, I'd like to just tell Eric, I just loved his book on Ron Spears, man. That was well done. Um, probably Thank the you. best book I've read on on uh, anything World War II, really. It was really good. Wow, and thank you. And well-researched. I loved it. Um, but I wanted to ask J.D., too, like, with all the World War II stuff he's done, he had, and I know that you went to Audie Murphy's grave, which was a great video, too, yeah. and a good tribute to him, but are you going to do any uh, anything on on Audie Murphy? Yes. Um, yeah, one of these days I'll, I'll be... Um, I just moved it because it's interfering. Right. Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to distract you. Sorry about that. Um, I'm messing up the operation down, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I, I've got uh, a couple of uh, ideas on some Audie Murphy stuff that, that I would like to do. Uh, one, going over to um, like southern France, um, where, where the 3rd Infantry Division landed uh, during World War II, and, and kind of talking about where... Uh, he performed actions that led to him being awarded the Medal of Honor. Um, and then I, I would also like to go to uh, the crash site where where he was killed. Um, but, yeah, it's it's uh, it's on my, my long list of things that I would like to. Where is the crash site that he was killed? It's in Virginia. West Virginia, I think. It's, it's actually not too far mm -hmm. away from here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We could probably go down there one afternoon yeah, when you're here next. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, it's on uh, Brushy Mountain, I believe, um, in okay. just uh, 15 miles. Is it south of Roanoke or okay, north of Roanoke? Okay, yeah. yeah, I thought but, it was in uh, Also, I yeah, I got to go on a, an awesome tour this uh, summer. I went to uh, 
Greenville, Texas, and met up with some people down there that took me on some amazing tours. It's um, a really great place to visit is Greenville, Texas, and the American Cotton Museum. They've oh. got some amazing relics that really cool place. So. Okay. Oh, yeah, I've looked at that place online. You know, you know uh, the Gettysburg Museum of History has one of his uniforms. So uh, maybe we'll feature that on American Artifact at some point. Yeah, you should. Where was that uniform in there? Is that is that the, is that on a mannequin? It's on uh, like a half mannequin. A half mannequin. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it's up. Um, oh. Yeah, it's it's in the room that has some of the Dick Winters items, yeah. and we have a couple of famous uniforms in there. But yeah, it's uh, it's it's the uh, khaki uniform for four pocket uniform he wore in some of the famous photos that when he came back and did a bunch of publicity including the same uniform he has on in the famous life magazine photograph of right. him and we got some other stuff from him as well um came from his first wife uh wanda hendrix lisa audie murphy have you uh, ever been to the gettysburg museum of history Actually, no, and uh, J.D.'s got me so pumped that uh, I'm saving my money to hopefully have a trip up there. I would love to go there. I binge-watch J.D.'s videos of that museum uh, and just wish I was there and pretend. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really cool museum. I was just in there earlier, and uh, the my favorite room is the JFK room. Oh. Because there, there's just I don't know why it's just like the little things like the little pads that he doodled on and stuff. Yeah, yeah. just those those really cool connections to him as a real person, not you know a president, which of course those aren't real people. Um, and so uh, that's my favorite. And then the Dick Winter stuff, the the World War II room back there, um, uh, across from the Kennedy room, is my uh, other favorite room. Because that, that's some really cool stuff in there. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you got to check it out and and take your time. Like, give yourself, I would say, three hours and spend an hour. Well, I don't know, half hour to an hour in in each room. There's more than three rooms, so that the math doesn't really work out. So you're gonna have to figure <laughs> that out. I'm not good at math, but spend a lot of time in each room because, as we were saying before, JD and I were talking to that kid, and and, uh, and he's like, every time I come here, there's like something new and. And uh, and it's true, like the the walls from floor to ceiling are just covered in stuff, and it's not decorations. Yeah, it's like everything is a historical artifact, right? For the most part, pretty much. Yeah, yeah basically. Yeah. Um, and it's really cool. And then there's some there's some cool things because sometimes there's something. Um, what was it in in the in the the stuff with all of Hitler stuff? Um, there was a uh, Saddam Hussein's plate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. sometimes there's something that's not related to everything else in there, just kind of thrown in. But I th I like that because it's all it's like a it's like where's Waldo kind of <laughs> like it's like yeah. a treasure hunt, you know. Well, we have some of Hitler's silver, so I put the Saddam silver. Yeah, it makes sense. Near there, yeah. Tyrants and yeah. their silverware. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> makes total sense. Well, Lisa, you got to try it uh, next time you come out here. Have you ever been out here? I have not been out there. Now, I was born in Pennsylvania, but not Gettysburg. <laughs> oh, really? But I have, yeah, I have actually uh, bought two things from the Gettysburg Museum store uh, oh, cool. there. And, and I'm telling you, it's a great, they got great stuff in there. I'm really oh, glad you. and thankful to JD for turning me on to that place. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Well, uh, let us know when you're out thank next you. time and we'll all go get drinks, okay? It sounds like a plan, All yeah. Right. Thank you for the call. Have a good weekend. All right, so let's see. We've got, I didn't mean to hang up on it, but there's a delay there. We've got, uh, let's see, it sounds like, uh, or it looks like Scott. Scott's on the air. Scott, okay. go ahead. Hey, uh, so uh, did I get the invitation to go get drinks as well the next time in Gettysburg? It's in Gettysburg. So, Depends. you know, you guys are... Depends on how this call goes. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> No, I, uh, you know, I actually, I was, I was able to meet you guys today at the Gettysburg Museum of History and just, you know, first and foremost, want to say thank you for how you guys keep history alive in a way that's factual and accurate and true and engaging and just so, so important. So thank you for what you guys do. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Um, it's just awesome. And, and then my question is, you, you know, without really trying to go maybe too far into the whole lost cause thing, is there ever a moment, a place, a time – a decision at Gettysburg where the Confederacy really could have won the battle or were they just from the get-go 
potentially doomed to the outcome that they were. Uh, what do you, what do you guys think? Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe a Gettysburg native. <laughs> Here, here's I, okay, oh here's here, we get this all the time. Okay, and and here's what I always say: God did not intend for the South to win the war. Period. I what a great answer. <laughs> my my take on it is yeah. I mean, I I think there are spots in the battle where Lee's army could have maybe done more damage. Sure. Um. Maybe maybe there are decisions in the battle that maybe would have led to less casualties mm-hmm. for the Confederates. I, I don't really see any scenario where he where they win. I don't either. Uh, Scott, let me ask you this question. Let's say let's say they win and dislodge the Union Army from the fields at Gettysburg. Then what? Like he doesn't destroy the army, they just withdraw. Then what happens? And I think that's just you know being a uh, an armchair historian. When you when you look at the Civil War, like anything that I see, when the South manages to prevail, it, it seems to be because the Union fails to recognize their superior you know advantages in numbers, terrain, whatever, um, and, and press, and essentially the South wins through Union's decision to retreat. And so I I can't foresee any way that. You know that the outcome would have been any different, which is why I'm asking people who are smarter than me to say, "Hey, you know, oh, you uh, called the wrong place." So I, 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 don't know if that, if, I was going to say, "Yeah, I don't know if that should alarm you guys if you've reached the same conclusions I have, or if it should alarm me." But um, you know, it's just one of, the, of course, the, the hypotheticals. You know, like I listened to the, the podcast about the what if, what if Stonewall Jackson were at Gettysburg, yeah. and ultimately, that's the other podcast. Would, wouldn't it change anything? <laughs> right? Yeah. What's exactly, the answer right? to that? Uh, yeah. Um, He'd be smelling pretty bad. Isn't that the funny answer? <laughs> yeah, right. He'd stink. <laughs> exactly. Right. <laughs> it, listen, uh, let me ask you, is there a, a, let me, you answer your own question. What do you think? You know, I really, when I look at, from the get-go, I mean, so early on prior to the war, right, you see, the uh, Secretary of War, who uh, Floyd, who is sending as many guns as he can from the north to the south, recognizing kind of what's happening 1859-ish. I think even even then, you know, as a Virginian, he knew as soon as the north and south disassociate, yeah, I mean, you, you look at the, the numbers of manufacturing and manpower and all those different advantages, and I can't just – I really can't foresee any situation where – even the myth of Lee uh, or the myth of Stonewall Jackson can, through a protracted conflict with as many casualties as the Civil War had, can prevail. I mean, even if it becomes a war of, of complete attrition, which you know, I think in a lot of ways it is, I don't see a, a different outcome, which is, again, why I, why I was very interested to hear what you guys think, because I know for sure that this is something you live and breathe and um, understand mm-hmm. at a much higher level than I do. Well, so my, my thing is always you hear people that, have gone no further than reading the killer angels or watching the movie. And they say, sure. if only Longstreet had let hood go around the right. <laughs> and, um, and then that's like a perfect, and it's not an opportunity to berate people. It's an opportunity to educate people as to what hood might've encountered had he gone around the right. Yeah, the sixth core, the sixth core is on its way up. The fifth core is already back in that area there behind the round tops. Um, and and I believe they're on their way, so the uh, he would have he would probably would have met with disaster. It would have been a worse defeat, I think, because he's focusing on rolling up the Union line that he know exists, and then a whole new line is forming on his right flank and rear, perhaps. So uh, that there is not an option. And Longstreet and Lee were both right in not allowing. A flanking maneuver around the right on that part there, and then if Yule had taken uh, Culp's and Cemetery Hill, so what? Then the, the the battle lines just would have changed, the, and the Union was trying to protect the Baltimore Pike. They didn't care about the hill. The hill was there because it protected the Baltimore Pike from where they were on the first day. But let's say Yule was able to take it and pushes them a little further south down the pike. Well, maybe they could use Rock Creek as a uh, as a, uh, a natural boundary, and uh, Wolf's Hill as uh, some kind of uh, fortitude, uh, fortress of solitude or something. <laughs> so, like, it just would have changed the maps that we look at and maybe the boundaries of the park, but I don't think it would have changed the war or the outcome of the battle or the outcome of the war. 
I think they still would have lost. Eric, what about you? Yeah, yeah so maybe I agree. Just... <laughs> <laughs> Eric Dorr agrees. <laughs> How about you, Eric Money? Do you agree? More or less. More or less. That's enough for me. Yeah. That's enough for me. We don't really have enough time, though. No, no, yeah, we don't. The guys have a know. dinner reservation in Hoofin and Fell. Um, <laughs> all right, so... <laughs> So, nice uh, plug. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's how it works. <laughs> um, it, it, did that satisfy you, Scott? Yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's always, you know, I enjoy listening to you guys, and so I always enjoy hearing your thoughts on, on whatever the topic is, so I appreciate your time. And Let me ask you. Like, I just appreciate right. it. Like I said, how you guys keep history alive. So I, I can't hear what he's saying because I don't. Oh, you don't have your headphones on. But um, I, I, I will say that most of these what-ifs. Yes revolve around this notion that I take umbrage with mm-hmm. that George Meade is a very cautious man. Mm. And, George Meade. And I am waiting for somebody cautious to provide man. me proof in Meade's wartime record up until Gettysburg that Meade is a cautious yeah. man. Yeah, he doesn't seem too cautious at Fredericksburg. No. He seems like his blood is up and he runs no. back and yells at Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. so much at Antietam either. No. Or really on the seven days when he gets wounded on the line. Yeah. Uh, I I'm waiting. If somebody can provide me proof that, that George Meade is some weak, sniveling dude from Philadelphia, <laughs> I'm, I'm all ears. Yeah. Uh, Eric at addressinggettysburg.com. Please send it in. There you go. <laughs> send it in. Send it in. Uh, yeah. It, it's, I, you know, it's like wasting time. I yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Now, my, so, quite, Scott, I have a question for you. You mentioned before, you know, I listened to the podcast and you talk about what if Jackson was here. We never talked about that. That's the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. They yeah, did a whole tour on it. So do you actually listen to Addressing Gettysburg? And remember, <laughs> when you answer this question, the whole coming down here and having beer with us is in the offing. So answer carefully. Go. So my first – let me. I'm, I'm going to give you a long answer here. Uh, and so okay, here my first go. interaction with Gettysburg, uh, was it, was, it was as an 8-year-old kid sitting in my living room watching Ken Burns the war. Oh, cool. Hell yeah. And I've always wanted to come to Gettysburg. JD's content on Gettysburg was what really got me to say, hey, I really need to get up to Gettysburg. Okay. And the first time, the first time that I subscribe to your podcast is today. But it's because I met you at the Museum of History today. Oh. And you have somebody who who is interested, right? I like I'm gonna unfortunately I'm gonna comment. If you have an answering machine with a phone number, I might you know I might just call and leave endless messages. We, we, do, we do have a voicemail. Oh, so the number you called here, you can call and leave a voicemail, and we'll play it on our live Friday show and mock you. <laughs> so wait, are you, are you were you the, the kid it, with the it, long it all, hair we were talking to? No, I was the big fat guy with the uh, Solomon Islands uh, black T-shirt. So it's not um, but I'm, I'm a fellow teacher, so that's. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Um, but no, like I, this is the first time for me being here, and it's just it's truly awesome to be here. And so I want to ask you one, one last question. So let's assume that Lee probably has come to the conclusion that he can't win. Why does Pickett's charge take place? Because it, I just I don't see any reasonable, rational military argument for Pickett's charge from any perspective. Well, what do you think's going why, on? There? Why do you think he's come to that conclusion? I, I, from this, I would assume that he would have a similar understanding of the situation that, that you do and I do with hindsight, which is no, he didn't he have hindsight. Ultimately, he had. He, sight I, just, in front I of wonder. Him. So, so what do you think is going through his mind that he says Pickett's charge? This is going to change the outcome of the battle, as it's it's just sending men you know, across open ground to be killed, which he, you know, he's as familiar with Civil War tactics as anyone. Right. What do you think is going through his mind where he says this this is the way to go? The stock answer has always been he has attacked both flanks and the Union Army has weakened the center to uh, reinforce the flanks. So therefore, the center must be the weakest, the thinnest. And it will be the easiest to pierce through if the artillery can uh, do its job by blasting the hell out of it. That's the stock answer that everybody's given uh, before, but uh, there's there's nuances to that answer as well. Eric, I, did you? I heard you. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I actually I go through this with people about the uh, the Sickles move on the second. Okay. Right. 
we know what's going to happen mm-hmm. and we know where everybody mm-hmm. is, but these guys don't. Right. Uh, in in a lot of cases, they don't find out until after the war. <laughs> right. Um, right. I you know. I, yes. Lee, Lee, I don't think Lee would have just thrown essentially two and a half divisions at Cemetery Ridge without being reasonably certain that it was going to work. Yeah. I he, I I argue that he's not anywhere near the best general in U.S. history, but you he do. certainly isn't the worst. No. Um, no, and he's certainly not a murderer. He's sure. not just going to sure. trying to slaughter the, his army. The 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 point about you know attacking both flanks and weakening the center is true to a point, mm-hmm. right? Caldwell's division gets pulled off of, of of the second corps line, and it doesn't really come back, right? Or a really big chunk of it is never going to come back. Um, you've got kind of remnants of the first corps that get thrown in to try to shore it up, but it is weak Mm -hmm. i mean compared to either end of the federal line it is weak but it has that beautiful three quarters of a mile field in front of it well this is what we were talking about the other day yes with with bob and deb was the artillery doesn't do what it's supposed to do right they ran out of ammunition didn't they? Yeah, but it, it wasn't was, even effective. And Once the yeah, smoke it, got it, everywhere, yeah, you the, couldn't the, see. Um, yeah, the the fire just wasn't effective, as effective as it needed to be. It's still mm-hmm. effective. Oh yeah, there's a lot of casualties taken by artillery, but it's not as effective as it needs to be, right? Uh, those divisions go forward without their flanks being supported at all. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Right. I there's there's a lot of things that need to happen to make this attack successful. That just don't happen for one reason or another. Yeah, right. And to do it, to do an attack on just the center, you know, the, you know, to, why not order the whole army to advance so that yeah. you can't? Well, I know you can't, but why, like, why wouldn't he have tried to do something? I mean, he could have, he could, like Longstreet's, you know, other two uh, divisions or, were beaten up. Yeah, but they're all, but they could have made a feint. They could have done something. They're they're occupied with the fifth corps. A yeah. pretty good chunk of the sixth. Yeah. The remnants of the third. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They've got their hands full already. Yeah. And if they try to maneuver, they're going to end up being crushed. Right? That, that's not going to work. Yeah, and that's not going to help pick it now that yeah. I think about it because, yeah, the, the gap is still too big. Yeah, it, it was just uh, – uh, to me, it was a desperate move. And we were, we were talking about this. Uh, now that you're a subscriber to the show, I hope that you will uh, listen to our anniversary shows that come out on June or July 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Um, we do kind of get into this a little bit, and we have a little debate with a couple of uh, licensed battlefield guides here. A friendly debate, although we did get into a fist fight afterwards. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but that's, uh, yeah. Kind of, kind of along with that, you know, asking, you know, what is Lee thinking? Um, something else that I've always kind of wondered about and considered is just the night before, like on the end of day two of the battle, uh, Hayes and Avery on East Cemetery Hill, like, come pretty darn close to puncturing the line. Yeah, they get up to the top of the hill. Yeah, they. I mean, they make it to the top of the hill. Mm-hmm. They get pushed back. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if if I'm if I'm Robert E. Lee, I might be looking at that and saying, "Hmm, okay, it didn't work with two. Maybe if I really send in a big punch up the middle, um, you know, if I if I send in a bigger force, maybe maybe it can work. Maybe we can punch through and then and then follow up." That, but the that problem bridge. I think that Lee runs into here is something that I think Jackson all, uh, lamented when he was alive, obviously, and that is that uh, the, the the Army of Northern Virginia always had enough men to break the line, never enough to exploit the breach. And that's not a quote, I'm paraphrasing there. And and everywhere you, you find uh, those moments on this battlefield, you go, yeah, they're absolutely right, but who's behind them? Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. There's Thanks. nobody behind them. Uh, yeah. Well, nah, but they're, they're the not third ready. The core of the Army of Northern Virginia, which... <laughs> Well, isn't really led here. Yes. Uh, well, that's the that's I mean, the other it, thing. It, it occurs to me like Hayes and Avery on East Cemetery Hill. Who's supposed to be supporting them? Part of Hill's Corps. Yeah. Right. Who's supposed to be forging or supporting the flanks of well, there's the a, Longstreet assault? But you're talking about Parts Heath of Hill's Corps. You're talking about not Heath. I uh, don't know. Rhodes is Rhodes. in Yule's Corps. Anderson. Anderson. They're they're supposed to be supporting who? Hayes and Avery. He Anderson's division? 
Yeah, it's a brigade of Anderson's division. I believe. That was sent so over. They're supposed to, ah, uh, but they don't they never go. go. Uh, and and this is another thing, like you know, point out to me where George Meade is weak and vacillating. <laughs> um, where the hell is AP Hill for three days in July 1863? If yeah. you can find him, it's like where's Waldo? Yeah, where'd he yeah. go? Because nobody really knows. What was he doing for three days? He certainly wasn't commanding his corps. No, he was nursing his prostate. Anyways. Yep, I know. Well, so Scott, we hope that helped you uh, at least be more confused so that you're going to have to listen to the show more. <laughs> Glad we could muddy the waters for you. No, uh, it was, yeah, no, any, anytime there's beers and fist fights, and I can tell you about how great Dan Sippers is. Just uh, let me know. <laughs> oh, jeez, the here we go. You're one of those guys. All right, well, listen, uh, next time you're in town, you've, you've, uh, you've passed the test, so next time you're in town, you may, uh, you may come and have a beer with us, okay? Fantastic. I'll be in town until... Uh, end of the day tomorrow so if there's a place to i'm throw sorry down, we're all booked up whatever, uh, we're, we are all booked up tomorrow <laughs> so. <laughs> now, aren't you coming to the tour tomorrow morning i am i am to be at the oh, tour cool. tomorrow morning okay well there you so. go then pretend there's a beer and and just be happy that you get to hang out with us one more time okay <laughs> you haven't you have not heard my last stupid question so i'll see you tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> okay that's, thanks for being a sport <laughs> that's all that i have thanks. we'll see yeah, you right. tomorrow <laughs> All right, so we're running low on time here, so let's see. Uh, we've got one more person. Uh, oh, it's our buddy Tom Canavan from New York City. New York. How you doing there, Tom? Hey, Matt. How are you? How you guys doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Good to hear from you. What's up? Uh, just, well, two things. I had one thing, but now I'll ask another. Just listening to the conversation that just went on. Um, I think Pickett said it the best when he said he thinks the Yankee Army had something to do with them yes. losing at Gettysburg. Amen. Amen. <laughs> that's what to it that. boiled down to. Yep, that's right. Now I wanted to ask also um, in the museum. Now I I've never gone in there as of yet. You know, in 40 years of going down there, um, does Eric have any artifacts or memorabilia, paraphernalia, anything relating to September 11th? Yes, we do. We have a few um, artifacts from the the site, um, just some very small items that were picked up there. Okay. Um, I'll see what I can do if I can get you a couple of things. I'm a survivor from it. So. Oh, well, thank you. We would appreciate I, that. Yeah, do you have anything? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Tom. Do you have anything of yours? Yeah. Yeah, like do you have the shirt you were wearing that day? No, that was uh, uh, taken as evidence, evidence okay. um, that day, the bag, yeah, which, uh, you know, they didn't know the magnitude of everything, which I'm sure was uh, destroyed later because it was thrown in a bag. And when I walked out of the hospital that day without them knowing, I grabbed the bag of clothes. It sat in my garage for months. It stunk. <laughs> and uh, we just discarded yeah. it at that point. I, I didn't think a pair of pants and shirt would... Uh. Uh, you know, melted shoes were going to matter in the long run, yeah. and they, they wouldn't anyway. Well, no, because I'm um, thinking, because there's, there's video of you in it, and so, I mean, to put, you know, if we had that, we could put that, we, I say we, Eric could put that uh, shirt, at least, uh, next to a screenshot of you in the in the news interview. Tom, why don't you, if you can, <laughs> if you can briefly tell everybody your story, if you don't mind. Yeah, I'm kind of interested. Um... Well, I worked in I worked on the 47th floor of the North Tower. Uh, I was in the building when the plane hit my tower above. And uh, long story short, we were you know we worked our way down the steps. When we were leaving uh, through the mall, we didn't know the South Tower had been hit, and it it fell on top of us basically. It it um, it killed four of the people with me. Just they never even found them. Um, fractured my skull. Uh, I got burned pretty good, knocked around, but it. It turns out I'm, I'm one of the 19 people that got buried that got out alive afterwards. Uh, one of two that we actually dug ourselves out um, 40 feet, about four stories up and 75 feet diagonal. Um, when we when we came out there, the gentleman with me um, was killed, I believe. We've never heard from him. Uh, the way he went wasn't the way to go. Things were falling, uh, you know, just bodies were hitting around from people jumping and um, just by the grace of God and the luck, I was able to get out of there. Um, got about a block away, and then my tower came down. 
and um, you know got hit with all that stuff and you know TV you see the big cloud what you don't see in that cloud are desks and yeah. tables computers chairs telephones mm -hmm. people copy machines like you know it's sort of like getting hit with a wave on, at the ocean when the tide comes in you don't see what's in that wave mm -hmm. seashells and you know seaweed and driftwood you just see you know the outside of it but luckily I got through that I got into a little scuffle with uh, New York's finest which wanted me to go with them I, I had no idea I was hurt um, they got me on the ground and then you know they convinced me hey you need to go to the hospital so I went uh, to the hospital and they I went through a couple of oxygen tanks and stitches and staples my head uh, stuff on my burns then I was interviewed by like you know the police the FBI the men in black could have been, I, I have no idea who half these people were just asking me, you know, what did I hear? What did I see? Yeah. Um, when everybody left, I sat up, I pulled uh, the tubes out. I put on some scrubs from the clothing bin, had the dirty bin in the hospital. I threw them on and I just, I walked out of the hospital. I uh, got in touch with my wife who worked in Midtown at the time. Um, Walked up to Grand Central, and like I tell everybody from the kids' movie Madagascar, I met her at the clock at Grand Central, and uh, took the train home that day. All you know, head bandaged up, still had blood around my eyes, my ears, and stuff. And then the story leaked out over the years. Um, wasn't particularly proud of anything, you know, but right. um, I'm still here, and luckily, you know, it's all documented on video and things. Because I wouldn't believe it myself if if we didn't have the proof. Right. But, um, I remember you telling me that when yeah, you were in the hospital, wasn't. you you were watching it on TV, and I, I think you said something to the nurse. It's like, what the hell is that? And they said, that's what you just came yeah. out of, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I had I had no idea. I mean, you know, it, it's a part of the PTSD is your brain can never catch up to right what happened to you. Yeah. And just, you know, before 9 11, who would, who could think of a human body in 10,000 pieces? Yeah. Maybe right. six, maybe eight, you know, the arms, the legs. But for a body to be 5,000 pieces, like no one mm -hmm. ever, that, that never entered anyone's mind until then. It, you know, um, and that's what happens. Your brain, when you sleep, catches up. Yeah. Or tries. Well, Tom sat down uh, last. I think that was around the anniversary last year with me, um, or, or shortly thereafter, um, and recorded an interview that is uh, already edited and scheduled for publication on September 11th of this year for the anniversary. Um, so that's on our Patreon page. So it's Addressing Gettysburg. I'm sorry, patreon.com slash Addressing Gettysburg if you care to hear that and also support the show and uh, all that stuff. Tom, we, uh, we, have, to, uh, we have to run because we... Uh, Somebody has a dinner reservation, <laughs> and uh, I don't want to make listen, them wait. No, no problem. No, no problem. I'm I'm going to text a couple people now. Kat being a badass with a broken wrist, so I yeah. want to <laughs> wish her my best. There you go. Well, thank uh, you. But when you're down next time, stop in Eric's place and talk to him. Okay. Yeah, please do. I will be down there. All right. I will. I will. Uh, hopefully, if not August, then September. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, Tom. Good to hear from you. All him. right. I'll, I'll see you guys. All right. See you later. Thanks. Thank you. They bye, -bye. Oh, whip. Sorry. Hit you. Hit you. <laughs> Hung up on you there. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, all right. So we, you guys do have to get going. Yeah. I um, just wanted to say real quick, you know, some of the uh, future American artifact shows, and I'm sure there'll be some traveler ones as well. You know, we're planning a trip to Germany sometime in the fall, and we're going to bring some artifacts back just like we have with the Normandy trip. And, uh, you know, we have some challenges with that because we're probably going to bring some some mm. of the German items back. And How are you going to smuggle those in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, <laughs> you know, the, you can't, you, you know, the Nazi stuff isn't illegal there, but the symbol is. Right. So you have to cover it up. And then what do we do when we're filming? You know, like we did that in France when we were in Normandy. I had the German uniform that we brought back to the bunker it came out of. And it had an eagle, in, a German eagle with the swastika on it. So I, I kept it covered with with uh, painter's tape, you know, something safe. Right. And then when we got there, I just kind of took it off and we filmed. And I hoped that nobody would see us because we were in a bunker. But um, it worked out. But, you know, we, we were thinking about, you know, doing some stuff in Munich and Berchtesgaden. And, uh, you know, might bring some of the Hitler items back, maybe the keys to the eagle's nest or few other surprises right. and then we're, we're also thinking about maybe going to bastogne at some point in the summer 
and you know doing some more poignant uh, killed in action artifacts that we have you know it's always a challenge traveling with artifacts because they have to be small enough that we can travel mm -hmm. with them right you know we can't bring like <laughs> and of course you can't bring weapons or anything like that because no. you have to fly there yeah, so that would you know be fun though yeah could. oh yeah um do you uh trade scallops for nazi memorabilia scallops for nazi memorabilia yeah somebody says eric i'm a commercial scalloper can i trade you some fresh scallops for some <laughs> nazi memorabilia <laughs> I mean, scallops are delicious. Yeah, they they are. They are. Hey, I might consider truffles if I was in that position. I don't know about I don't know about shellfish. Yeah, scallops for truffles. Oh, truffles for Nazi memorabilia. Oh my God, they're like fifteen hundred dollars a pound. Yeah, they're not cheap. Well, it's not easy to get them. Well, no. Uh, okay, so uh, so the answer is no about the scallops. Well, I wish I could think of a very witty answer right now, but I can't. So forget uh, about well. witty. Just just do some business here. How yeah, many scallops okay. are we talking? Yeah. How many pounds of scallops? And does it come by like the bushel or uh, yeah. how does yeah. that work? <laughs> well, you could have like a scallop bake or something. We could have a big party. <laughs> we could rent out the Farnsworth, Camp Farnsworth back there. You know? Oh, yeah. It's like, yeah. And Camp we can Tiger. Have, like, yeah, Camp Tiger. Oh, wow. We could have a big barbecue, of, like a seafood <laughs> bake or something. That'd be fun. Uh, all right. Listen, they got to go. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. Uh, thank you guys for coming in. This oh, is always it. fun to talk to you. And, yeah. uh, and you be careful. <laughs> <laughs> and and remember Gettysburg Museum of History dot com if you want to buy some artifacts or twenty five pounds or whatever. twenty five pounds of scallops. <laughs> what what could they get for twenty five pounds of scallops? They just answered. I don't know. I don't Gosh. even know what the market price on scallops is right now. Yeah, what is it? Wait, it says twenty five pounds, and then it's saying fifty two point two pounds per bag right off the boat. Right off the boat. <laughs> wow. Right off the boat. Wow. Where, in like Rock Creek? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where are these scallops coming from? Is this like the Chesapeake or... Because I don't think you want scallops that are coming like out of near Manhattan. No. You don't want anything that's in that area. You don't want some Long Island scallops? No. How about some well, Guam maybe long... shrimp? Guam <laughs> shrimp sounds good. Yeah. Did you bring any shrimp back? Did you eat... What'd you eat out there? Shrimp. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I got. Some, he's referring to some jumbo shrimp that I got. They're thirty dollars a pound. Wow, wow. Well, tell him to send me an email. Info at Gettysburg Museum of History dot com. Info at muse Gettysburg Museum of History dot com. There you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, and we will talk to you guys later. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg.